So let's do some extremely high yield radiographic images and discuss the topics related to them. This is croup and it is most commonly seen in the pediatric population. The green circle is highlighting the steeple sign that is classically seen in patients with croup. This image is so high yield, so memorize it. Memorize every single image that I'm going to show you. They're all high yield, honestly. So let's discuss how we can remember croup. So croup is actually called laryngotracheobronchitis or LBT for short. So LBT is caused by the parainfluenza virus. And these patients typically have a seal-like bark. And on x-ray, you can see the steeple sign. As you see here, the L's are highlighted. That's one way for us to remember the key features for croup. So L, laryngotracheobronchitis, and then the L in parainfluenza, <laughs> influenza, the L in steeple sign, and the L in the seal bark. And let's move on to epiglottitis. So this is also more commonly seen in the pediatric population as well. The green circle is highlighting the thumb sign that is key in the radiological findings of epiglottitis. We can remember the key features of epiglottitis with the Ds. Unvaccinated, respiratory distress, drooling, tripod stand, inspiratory strider, and they have to go to the ED or the emergency department. So remember that epiglottitis is an emergency. So these patients present acutely in respiratory distress. So they'll have the classic tripod stand, the drooling, difficulty breathing, and an exam favorite is that they would mention that the child is unvaccinated. And it's important to note that they have an inspiratory strider. And like we said before, it is an emergency. So these patients more likely will or have to present to the emergency department for treatment. Foreign body aspiration should always be considered in a pediatric patient with a sudden onset of unexplained symptoms, such as shortness of breath or coughing. So both of these patients here have foreign bodies. On the left, it is possibly a coin, and that's very obvious. But most of the time, the objects are radiolucent, so you can't really see what object it is, but you have to look for other signs. So more than 50% of aspirated foreign bodies lodge in the right main stem bronchus. X-ray findings may show an ipsilateral hyperinflation and diaphragm flattening. You may also see a mediastinal shift. So this is a classic image of a patient with Pankow's tumor. So we should always suspect Pankow's tumor in a patient who is a chronic smoker with shoulder pain or Horner syndrome. And recall that Horner syndrome includes ptosis, meiosis, and anhydrosis. A Pankow's tumor is also called a superior sulcus tumor, and that's kind of good to know because it helps you to remember the location of this Pankow's tumor. So just look at this image and remember it. It's extremely high yield. If you take a good look at this image, you can see that the hemidiaphragm is elevated. One of the causes of an elevated hemidiaphragm is a paralyzed phrenic nerve. And this can occur due to a Pankow's tumor. So as you can see, a Pankow's tumor really affects the cervical ganglion a lot. Because recall that C5 keeps the diaphragm alive and that can be affected in a Pankow's tumor. And for Horner's syndrome like we just discussed, that's when C8 to T1 is affected. So tension pneumothoraces are extremely high yield. 
And my teachers would love to say that this chest x-ray should not even have been taken in the first place. And that's because we can have a strong clinical suspicion and even diagnosis using our examination skills. So on exam, we'd note that there is ipsilateral absent breath sounds, hyperresonance, decreased firmitus, tracheal deviation to the contralateral side, and there may be hypotension due to the compression of the inferior vena cava. So that's one reason why this chest x-ray should not even have been taken. But the first and more important reason is that this is an emergency. That's why for initial treatment of this patient, we use a needle thoracentesis and then we place a chest tube afterwards. However, in the case of a simple pneumothorax, then we just go straight to the chest tube. A key way of distinguishing between a simple pneumothorax and a tension pneumothorax is that in a tension pneumothorax, there is deviation of the trachea to the contralateral side or deviation of the mediastinum to the contralateral side. However, in a simple pneumothorax, that is not seen. Another way that examiners like to test pneumothoraces is that you have a tall, very slim male presenting, and then this patient suddenly develops difficulty breathing. So in that case, that patient developed a spontaneous pneumothorax. So recall that, especially Tall, slender males, they are more likely to develop a spontaneous pneumothorax. So in this image, the green or mint or blue, whatever you're seeing, arrow, is pointing to the shift of the mediastinum. However, the red circle is showing you where you would find hyperresonance or decreased breath sounds on exam. Interstitial lung disease may be caused by asbestosis, berliosis, coal, silicosis, or sarcoidosis. So for these patients, you will see honeycombing on CT or a reticular nodular ground glass appearance on chest x-ray. In these images, those tiny white arrows are pointing to things called pleural plaques. And pleural plaques are seen in mesothelioma. So mesothelioma occurs due to asbestos exposure. It's very high yield to know that smoking does not increase the risk of mesothelioma. Also recall that samoma bodies are also seen in mesothelioma. These samoma bodies are seen in papillary thyroid cancer, serous cisadenocarcinoma, meningioma, and of course, mesotheliomas. So essentially, remember that if you hear mention of pleural plaques, think mesothelioma. If you hear about somoma bodies, think about mesothelioma. Another way that they like to mention somoma bodies is by describing them as lamellated concentric calcified structures or laminated calcifications, but that's just more words for saying somoma bodies. And remember that mesothelioma is related to asbestos exposure and not to smoking. These blue arrows are pointing to eggshell calcifications, and these are seen in patients with silicosis. Just remember that these eggshell calcifications are seen primarily in the upper lobes. Chest x-ray findings for pneumonia can show lobar consolidation or interstitial consolidation. Pneumonia is extremely high yield for all step exams and they honestly deserve a video for themselves. The upper lung lobes are more frequently affected by tuberculosis. Aspergillosis also likes the upper lobes too. We should suspect bronchopulmonary aspergillosis in patients with asthma 
and elevated IgE and infiltrates in the upper lobes of the lung. Sarcoidosis is extremely high yield and you should have a high clinical suspicion in an adult African-American female with cough and dyspnea. The chest x-ray shows hyalur lymphadenopathy, which can be described as a mediastinal fullness and scattered reticular opacities in the upper lobes of the lungs. Sarcoidosis also includes non-caseating granulomas, hypercalciuria, and hypercalcemia. So this image is showing subcutaneous emphysema. So this is when there is gas or air within the subcutaneous tissues. It has many causes such as trauma, pneumothorax, esophageal rupture, or the very high yield gas producing organism. If you know which organism I'm talking about, please leave them in the comment section below. It's extremely high yield and practically always tested in some way, shape or form. In this same image, you may also note that this patient also has rib fractures. Recall that a filial chest occurs when greater than three consecutive ribs are ruptured in two or more places, and this may be due to blunt thoracic trauma. So for these patients, you may notice that there is paradoxical motion compared with normal chest wall movements. The main management for these patients is pain control and supplemental oxygen. One way that examiners like to test this is say that there is a patient who has rib fractures, they have a respiratory rate of 8 and they have hypercapnia and they're like, what's the best next step? It's usually pain control. These patients are also at risk of developing respiratory failure due to a pulmonary contusion and accumulation of blood or edema in the alveoli. So it's very important to identify these rib factors and treat it accordingly. If you have started any question bank, then you have probably already seen this. But this is a lung nodule. So it's very high yield to know that the first step in evaluating a solitary pulmonary nodule is to obtain the previous radiographic lung images. If there is no growth over two to three years, then this can rule out a malignancy. But if there is growth, or if the previous films are not available, then a CT scan should be done. And this is emphysema. So a chest x-ray of a patient with emphysema may show large volume hyperlucent lungs, flattened hemidiaphragms, widened costophrenic angles, horizontal ribs, and a narrow mediastinum. So for this image, I really don't think that this circle is even necessary, but this is a pleural effusion. And pleural effusions are so high yield on so many different levels, and I will definitely make a video about this soon. So here we see a patient that has an incorrect placement of the endotracheal tube. So the endotracheal tube is most commonly placed in the right bronchus, incorrectly of course. It should actually be about 5 centimeters above the carina and we can know if the ET tube is in an incorrect place by doing a chest x-ray and by doing an exam. And on exam, there would be unequal breath zones on each side. And finally, we have a pulmonary contusion. So these patients typically present like after a motor vehicle accident. And when you do their chest x-ray, you see bilateral interstitial infiltrates and they also have hypoxia. So they kind of describe this classic white out lung appearance and that's pulmonary contusions. 
So as you can see in this video, I focus on respiratory radiologic images. So if I miss out any high yield ones, then be sure to comment them down below. And in part two, I will mention them. But as always, if you like this video, be sure to power up the like button, hit subscribe and that notification bell. As always, thank you for watching and to continue learning more, click this video right here.